Hi, I'm Kathy Marks, the IT Accessibility Coordinator for ASU's Enterprise Technology. Today, I'd like to talk to you about accessible forms. We're going to cover a lot and we don't have much time, so hold on to your hats. But before we dive into forms, we need to nail down some definitions of a few concepts so that we're all on the same page. Then we'll talk about labels and names, grouping related fields, submit buttons, errors, required fields, help text, and contrast. Before we do anything else, though, I just want to make sure you all know about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. The Department of Justice says that all public university websites must comply with WCAG Level AA. You should also know a little bit about the Accessibility Tree. Very briefly, the Accessibility Tree is created in parallel with the DOM by the browser. It's a pruned down version of the DOM tree containing only semantic elements. So generic elements like divs and spans won't make it into the accessibility tree. Assistive technologies like screen readers use the accessibility tree. It names elements, it describes them, and gives them roles and states. For instance, enabled or disabled, collapsed or expanded. Finally, you should also know what ARIA is. Very briefly, native HTML elements and attributes have semantics and behavior already built in. And browsers and assistive technologies understand what they are, what they do, and how they should behave. But HTML is limited. It only has three interactive elements, links, form fields, and buttons. So for anything more complex, developers have to create custom elements out of generic divs and spans. But divs and spans have no programmatic meaning or any built-in roles or states or properties even. This is where ARIA comes in. ARIA is a supplement to HTML that allows developers to provide information to assistive technologies when HTML can't. ARIA is used to name elements and to define things like keyboard accessibility, roles, and states. ARIA does not make elements do anything. It merely tells assistive technologies, like screen readers, what to say so that users know what an element is and how to use it. Developers still have to write a lot of custom CSS and JavaScript to actually make a custom component behave the way it's supposed to. That's a lot of work. And the reason why the first rule of, ARIA, of the ARIA spec is to not use ARIA, if you can possibly help it. If a native HTML element will do the trick, use it. Now, I do have one super hot tip about creating custom components. Let's take tabs, for example. There's no HTML element for tab groups or tabs. So if I want tabs, I'm gonna have to custom build a group of them from divs and spans, right? Hmm, let's find out. Now, if I'm a smart developer, and of course I am, I'll go to the patterns library and ARIA authoring practices guide, find the tabs design pattern and learn about the ARIA tabs element, what kind of keyboard interaction it should have and what roles, states, and properties it can have. Then I'll take a look at an example. I can play around with it to see how it behaves. I can even grab the example HTML, CSS, and JavaScript code and use that to build my own tabs. Let's go into the dev tools and look at this example. I can see that it's made out of tips. But if I go to the accessibility panel, I can see that this div is no longer just a div. It's been reassigned as a tab list and the ARIA labeled by attribute references this H3 element, which even names the new tab list. ARIA allows me to pass this information on to a screen reader so the user knows what the element is. So let's listen in voiceover. Maria Alifeld, selected tab, one of four. You are currently on a selected tab, one of four. So instead of just a blob of generic divs, I now have a programmatically valid tab list. ARIA can also be used to reassign other elements. For instance, this button now has the role of tab. 
It is the selected tab and it controls or is associated with tab panel one. It also has the name of Maria Offelt. That is getting, it's getting from the content. Uh, wait, what is this list? ARIA labeled by not specified. ARIA label not specified. What is this list? We've come to one of the most interesting, though some might say frustrating, things about ARIA. So pay close attention now because we're about to delve into the world of forms and we're going to start our journey with a discussion of labels and names. Every form input must have a visual label and an accessible name. WCAG success criteria 3.3.2 says, labels or instructions are provided when content requires user input. And WCAG success criteria 4.1.2 says, for all UI components, the name and role can be programmatically determined. The important thing to remember is this, Labels are the visible names of elements. The accessible name is the name that's programmatically associated with an element, as well as the name the browser exposes to the usability tree. What you saw earlier in the DevTools was a list of the ways you can supply an accessible name. They're given here in the priority that browsers and assistive technologies follow. So ARIA labeled by takes precedence and will override an ARIA label if one is present and an ARIA label will override a label, and so on. We'll come back to accessible names in a moment. Under most circumstances, the best way to supply a visible label is to use the HTML label element because, well, that's what it was designed to do. It also has the widest support. In addition, if you click on the label with a mouse, focus will go to the input. This increases the click target size, which is helpful on small screens and for some people with motor disabilities, particularly with small radio buttons and check boxes. It's also a handy way to test that a label is programmatically associated with its input. There are two ways to add visible labels. Both are implicit labels because they are implicitly assumed to be associated with their inputs through proximity and position. In DevTools, we see that the field above has a visible label, but examining the markup shows that there is no accessible name specified. This means no name will get passed to the accessibility tree, and when screen reader users get to the form field, they won't be able to identify it or understand what they're being asked to input. With our second example, we see that there is an accessible name that comes from the label. Unfortunately, what DevTools doesn't tell you is that not all assistive technologies recognize the programmatic name from this type of markup. For the time being, we can't use this label method. To provide an accessible name, a label must be programmatically associated with its input. Explicitly associate the label and the input by adding a for attribute to the label and an ID attribute to the input and giving them equal values. Now our label and input are explicitly associated. And when we examine the markup in DevTools, we see the input has an accessible name that will be passed to the accessibility tree. Once again, labels are the recommended and most robust way to add an accessible name. But in some situations, you may not have the ability to change the markup or add a label. This is where the rest of that list of prioritized accessible naming techniques comes in. If you absolutely cannot add a label, but there's text somewhere else in the markup you could repurpose, use the ARIA label and ID attributes to programmatically associate the label and the input and provide an accessible name. Note, however, that although the ARIA labeled by text is visible, clicking on it with a mouse will not set focus to the input. So it's not as accessible an option as a label element. If there is no label or text available anywhere in the markup and you can't supply one, use an ARIA label attribute to create an accessible name. However, note that this does not provide a visible label. So it's not recommended in most cases. If there is an element on the display that users might think is a label, make sure it matches the ARIA label. Otherwise, screen readers could announce two different names. Grouping related fields. WCAG success criteria 1.3.1 info and relationships says that when fields are visually related, they must also be programmatically related. 
This group of related address fields is confusing. Is it asking for your shipping address, billing address, maybe a work address? Although these radio buttons are visually related, we can see from the markup that nothing programmatically relates them to one another. When radio buttons aren't programmatically related, the user can select every radio button. Always group related fields together with a field set and a legend. Grouping supplies context and creates a relationship between fields. If field groups are identified by a legend, screen readers will announce the beginning and end of the field set, as well as the name. Address. Group. Address. Street. Street. And a text. When radio buttons or checkboxes are further identified as a group with the name attribute, screen readers announce the number of options in the group. How do you prefer to be contacted? Group. How do you prefer to be contacted? Phone. Radio button. One of three. Email. Radio button, two of three. Text, radio button, three of three. You are currently on a radio button, three of three. To select One thing to note is that legends must be the child of the field set. So the field set on this for isn't valid. If groupings and context make a difference visually, you have to ensure that context and relationship is also being conveyed programmatically. So screen readers and other assistive technology users benefit as well. As with field labels, if you are unable absolutely to supply a legend for a field set, you can use ARIA labeled by or ARIA label. But remember, ARIA label doesn't provide a visual label, so use it only when absolutely necessary. Also note that single checkboxes and simple pairs of radio buttons, for example, yes, no pairs, do not need field sets and legends. In addition, nested field sets can cause odd screen reader behavior and should be avoided. And just a quick word about select lists. WCAG's success criteria 1.3.1 says that using opt group to group option elements inside a select helps users because it visually breaks up long lists so that users can move easily and locate what they are interested in. Finally, avoid using multiple select menus. Some browsers don't provide intuitive keyboard navigation for them, and many users do not know the keyboard shortcut to select multiple items. Others find complex keyboard shortcuts difficult to perform. A group of checkboxes provides similar functionality in a much more accessible way. I have just a few brief comments on buttons. WCAG success criteria 1.1.1 says that all non-text content presented to the user must have a text alternative. If an image is used for a submit button, ensure that an equivalent text alternative is provided in the markup. In addition, don't use reset buttons because they are often accidentally clicked and are particularly irksome to people with motor impairments. And finally, some developers disable the submit buttons until the user has correctly filled out the form. Please don't do this. Disabling a submit button removes it from the tab index and users won't be able to get to the button. And users who are not tech savvy or who experience some cognitive disabilities may not understand why the button is disabled. WCAG success criteria 1.3.5 says the purpose of each input field should be identified. One of the best ways to do this is to autocomplete in the input. When you add an autocomplete attribute, browsers can offer to auto-populate fields, which helps people with some cognitive and mobility disabilities. Users don't have to type as much, and that can result in fewer errors, typos, and form validation problems. Autocomplete is pretty cool. Input types like text aren't very specific, but autocomplete provides much more information about their purpose. For instance, you can programmatically specify a given name or a family name. What's more, assistive technologies and browsers can use this information to suggest hints to users. For instance, they can display a little telephone icon next to an autocomplete tell or an envelope besides an autocomplete email. This is very helpful to users with some cognitive and learning disabilities, as well as for non-native English speakers. There are over 50 possible values for autocomplete in the HTML spec. Try some of them out. We don't have time to go into much detail, but I wanted to mention the input mode attribute as another way to help users 
input the correct information in form fields on mobile. You can specify one of the eight input modes to request the appropriate virtual keyboard from the browser. Providing users with a specific virtual keyboard is an easy way to give cues about the type of data you want them to enter. WCAG success criteria 3.3.1 through 3.3.4 and 4.12 all deal with how we communicate required fields visually and programmatically, especially to assistive technologies like screen readers. Developers can prevent errors from occurring by identifying both visually and programmatically when fields are required. Ideally, all fields on a form should be required. If your form has a lot of optional fields, you're asking the user for a lot of unnecessary information, which could cause increased cognitive load for users, high levels of validation errors, and excessively long completion processes. On the form above, there is no visual indication of which fields are required. How do we make this both visually and programmatically accessible? Adding the text required to the label is the most robust method and communicates the requirement visually. By linking the label and the input with for and ID values, screen readers will also read the required text in the label as part of the accessible name. Avoid asterisks to indicate required fields. Not all users recognize the purpose of an asterisk. People with cognitive learning and language difficulties don't always recognize the meaning of symbols and icons. In addition, screen readers announce the asterisk as star. For these reasons, it's recommended to use required in the label as the best method for indicating required fields. However, if you are forced to use an asterisk, you must explain at the top of the form what the asterisk means. Otherwise, you fail success criteria 3.3.2 labels and instructions. To indicate programmatically that a field is required, add ARIA required equals true. When the focus goes to the input, the screen reader will announce it as, a, as required. Finally, don't use the HTML required attribute. Some browser and screen reader pairings announce fields with the required attribute on them as invalid. In addition to identifying required fields, we also need to assist the user in correctly completing form fields by adding instructions and formatting requirements. This prevents errors, reduces form validations, and helps our users' stress levels. Short form instructions can be included in the accessible name, as in this example. Longer instructions should be provided outside the label and programmatically associated with the input using the ARIA described by attribute. When users make mistakes, when inputting forms or omit required information, we need to let them know what the error is and how to fix it. One of the most common ways to indicate a form error is by changing the color, usually to red. But WCAG success criteria 1.4.1 says that color should not be used as the only visual means of conveying information. People with color blindness may not perceive the color change, and some users may not understand the significance. Not only is this an inadequate visual means of indicating when a field is invalid, it also doesn't provide a programmatic indication of an error that screen readers and other assistive technology can announce. No native HTML element exists to indicate when a field is invalid. So to pro programmatically indicate that a field is invalid, we have to use ARIA. Adding an ARIA invalid equals true will cause screen readers to announce the field as invalid. In addition, you can use the ARIA invalid attribute in CSS to visually style the invalid field. Of course, the ARIA invalid attribute gives no information about what kind of error there is or how to fix it. The most robust way to indicate both visually and programmatically that there is an error and what it is, is by adding a text message. For users with vision, this is better than using an icon, which as we've discussed can be misunderstood. In addition, we can associate a text message with the input using ARIA described by, so that screeners can announce the message and users will know that there is an error. In addition to indicating the presence of an error, we also need to assist the user in how to fix the error. Again, the easiest way to achieve this is by indicating the requirements in the error message and associating the text with the input with an ARIA described by attribute. I'm sorry we had to run through these tips so quickly. There are still so many aspects of accessible forms we haven't touched on. You can always visit the ASU Accessibility site and you can contact me on Slack or email me. Are there any questions?